Hello, everyone. Welcome to session IM305. My name is Bo Hua Li. I'm a senior security consultant with AWS. I've been with AWS for a little bit over two years, and my specialty is identity and access management. Today, I'm super excited to be joined by Michael and Hutu from Guardian. Michael, could you please introduce yourself? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Mike Novak. Um, I'm with Guardian Life, and I'm on the security architecture team. Our role is to bring technology and the security org together, and I specialize in application security. Go ahead, Hatul. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Hatul Patel. Been uh, in the industry for about a little more than 20 years, uh, and been working at Awesome Guardian for more than six. Uh, as, a, as a team lead for DevOps, it gives me opportunity to work on the latest and greatest tools. That's one of the tools we're demoing today. Um, and, and just to make sure that we have the footprint and secure footprint in our cloud environment, two things to prove this. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Hutu. So before I get into the agenda, let me ask you a few questions. For the folks in the room, raise your hand if you are a developer. One person? Raise your hand if you are a security professional. Awesome. And finally, raise your hand if you have shift your IAM controls to the left. Oh, great. So either you are a builder or a security professional. If you ever struggle with finding the balance between agility, DevOps, or security, you are at the right session. Here is the agenda for today. We are going to start with providing you an overview of AWS IAM Access Analyzer. Then I'm going to walk you through a few different approaches for managing IAM policies we've seen used commonly. Then Michael is going to talk about the IAM objectives and the opportunities to improve IAM controls at Guardian. Then Hutu is going to show you how Guardian reaches to an ideal solution to meet their IAM requirements and how they manage and implement a scale with automation. Hutu will also talk about how exception process is managed at Guardian with automation. And finally, Make sure you stay to the end. I will give you a live demo to show how this solution works in action. As a reminder, this is a 300 level session. We're going to dive deep into technical details about permissions management and automation in AWS. So you wouldn't be comfortable if you are not familiar with IAM policies, IAM roles, CICD pipelines and the like. So, what are the key takeaways from this session? Today, we're going to show you how Guardian enables its developers to move fast without compromising IAM policies, best practices, and the principle of least privilege. Today, we aim to show you how you can not only achieve your security objectives, but also improve your security posture and accelerate your business by doing the following few things. Getting to the right permission in AWS is a continuous cycle. AWS IAM Access Analyzer helps you streamline permissions management throughout each step in the cycle. IAM Access Analyzer has a few features. The first one is policy validation. With policy validation, it helps you to author secure and functional IAM policies. It's able to tell you if your IAM policy is overly permissive. It's also able to tell you if your IAM policy contains an error. It can be things such as invalid action and a missing comma. 
It also gives you general warning that tells you your IAM policy doesn't conform to best practices, but not a security risk. And finally, it gives you suggestions on how your IAM policy can be improved without changing the permissions of your IAM policy. The next feature is policy generation. Now, if you just start with AWS, you are exploring AWS, you generally start with broader permissions. Over time, you start figuring out what does your workloads need, what are your specific use cases, you want to start right-sizing your permissions. Policy validation helps you with right-sizing permissions by generating IAM policies based on your activities in CloudTrail. You can further customize the IAM policies if you need to. For the next feature, IAM Access Analyzer uses automated reasoning to identify public or cross account findings to your resources. So I mentioned the term automated reasoning. Let me quickly explain it. Automated reasoning is based on formal reasoning logic and the techniques. It allows IAM Access Analyzer to run a comprehensive analysis across all access paths to your resources and identify external access. IAM Access Analyzer uses this analysis and turn it into public or cross account findings. When you turn on IAM Access Analyzer, it continuously reviews and monitors for supported resources, including new resources and updated resource permissions. And finally, we have preview access. Preview access uses the same analysis I just explained. Instead of detecting and monitoring external access, it's able to verify any public or cross account access to a resource before your resource is deployed in your environment. And today, our focus is policy validation. Now, I'd like to walk you through a few different approaches for managing IAM policies we've seen used commonly over time. The first one is a centralized approach. In this approach, builders tell security team what they need, what they want, and the security team go implement it. There are some benefits of this approach. One of them is that um, you have IAM experts who are building your IAM policies. However, this process can take a really long time. As a result, you have a very slow feedback loop. And you end up with a very common scenario where the builders often request more permissions than they need because they know how long you will take to iterate and take to get what they need. Or sometimes they simply don't know what they need upfront. Therefore, this approach doesn't scale as you move more and more workloads to AWS. In the second approach, we shift the responsibility of codifying IAM policies and roles from this central security team to builders. So there are some benefits here, especially as it relates to accountability. Because now, the decisions about access is being made by the people who are closest to the application, who are most familiar with the application. 
However, this process is still slow because it still gets a ton of applications relying on a central security team. On top of that, more policy defects may get through because the expertise you have in the previous approach where you have IAM experts who are writing your IAM policies may get lost. In the next approach, we introduced a tool to review IAM policies that was done manually in the previous approach. So now, the benefit of this approach comparing to the previous approach is that the feedback loop get faster because now you have a tool to review IAM policies. And the IAM policies should get past the checks by the tool before they get to your security team. However, the security team still needs to review and approve the IAM policies, so the feedback loop is not as fast as it could be. In this final approach, the entire development lifecycle is automated. The security team no longer needs to review and approve every single IEM policy. The goal here is to codify the security knowledge so that things can be automated. So in this case, we use policy validation with IEM Access Analyzer. Today, policy validation has over 100 checks, and we continue adding new checks over time. If you have a use case that is not covered by policy validation today, come talk to us after the presentation. We encourage you to think about automate and codify the checks to codify the security knowledge so that you can integrate it into your development lifecycle in an automated way. So in summary, this approach has fast feedback loop because everything is automated. Therefore, it enables your builders for faster code delivery as well as free up security team's time so that they can focus on other things, such as building guardrails, monitor and improve the automations, as well as building other type of security controls. With that, I'd like to hand it over to Michael to give us a little bit of information about Guardi. Uh, thanks, Bohan, for that clear introduction of the problem statement for the industry. But I want to give you a little more in, uh, detail about Guardian itself before we go into our use case. Guardian is a Fortune 250 uh, a life insurance company. We have many products like dental, vision, accident, and other types of insurance. Uh, we've been at this for a really long time. We've been around since 1860. And we and we have a primary purpose of improving the well-being of our employees, our customers, and just the general community. And we do that with three core pillars. We do that with wowing the customer. We want to exceed their expectations. Reimagining re mutuality. We're a mutual company. That means we're owned by our policy owners. We're not owned by stockholders. So we want you to feel like a policy with Guardian is more than a transaction. You're part of the club. And finally, we want to release what's possible. Not only it's a cultural mission to go ahead within our company to empower our internal employees to, to do what's best for themselves, which then they can do what's best for the company. So this project was a joint partnership with AWS, as we all know, uh, Guardian, which I just introduced, and Rearc, which is a software consultancy company. Uh, Dan is in the audience, the main person from REARC that went ahead and did the uh, work. Can you give a little wave for the audience? 
Oh, sorry, mine blind up here. Sorry about that. Dan is over there. Um, sorry about that. So some, some of the core objectives that we had. We wanted to go ahead and reduce the access of our application teams, Re you know, follow the, the principle of least privilege um, by reducing risk and making sure that we are going ahead and enforcing compliance at the same time. But we're also trying to balance that with not inhibiting our developers from going ahead and building what they need to, being able to experiment. We don't want to stifle them. So, so basically, we, and we also need to go ahead and make sure that this can all be enforced um, so the security team can go ahead and focus on the most important high impact, in, high impact items. So we want to go ahead and provide a tool that will go ahead and, uh, sorry, that is scalable and extensible as we grow as a company and our pipeline, the tool will grow with us. And no, none of these kind of tools are perfect. Um, you know, none of these scanning tools are perfect. We're always gonna have exceptions. How are we going to handle those exceptions when they come up, because they will? And how do we report on them so that way we, you know, compliance and other folks, we can track it and, you know, it's not a wild west. So these are some of the opportunities we had. We wanna go ahead and make sure that we securely deploy the policies, ensure that we're going ahead and meeting compliance. We have resource constraints. We have technical security experts and technical folks that are building, but they don't have infinite time. We want to reduce the manual effort they're having to do because their time is valuable. By reducing the, the manual time that we're doing things, that makes it scalable. But we're also balancing that with having some sort of centralized authority approval, some sort of automation. And most importantly, IAM is going to keep growing and changing. So this solution can't only work for the current IAM policies, but as new services come along, how will it be handled? Um, so that's a high level of what we're gonna be talking about. I'm gonna go ahead and hand over to Hatul to go ahead and talk more about the technicals. All right, thanks, Michael. Thanks um, for talking sick there. Yeah, yeah you're talking sick. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm pretty sure you heard a lot about how to automate uh, the access checks and access analyzer. Uh, just by looking at audience, can I get a hand sign of how many of you guys use CI CD pipelines to deploy infrastructure? Awesome, we got a whole bunch of them. And how many of you guys use tools like Terraform to deploy those infrastructure? Oh, awesome, almost everybody. So the reason why I asked you this question is because the tool can natively be integrated into your CI CD pipelines, uh, as well as it also honors using of Terraform. Right, so if you're using Terraform and using CI CD pipeline, you could still go ahead and use the tool. So looking at the uh, board, we have a couple of uh, diagrams here. We have tooling team and a developer's team. A tooling team is something that we call it as Guardian, Reorg, um, and AWS combined together to create the tool. So the tool that we're talking about is created by the tooling team. Uh, after developing the tool, we check it into an IAM compliance policy check code, and that is where the tool resides. That's where the bits of tools are. On the other hand, we talk about developers and giving them access to create infrastructure or infrastructure as code. So the developers are developing applications, right? So at Guardian, we have this unique combination of using a code for each application, which I suggest best practices, most of the companies assign uh, like a unique code to, a, to an application. The reason why we give a unique code to an application is because we use that in creation of resources and it makes sure that the resource we create on AWS is always unique to that application, right? So in our case, for the rest of the session, we are considering we are going to build an app called App 100, uh, as you can see on the screen. So a developer is trying to build an app called App 100 and he has a bunch of Terraform templates because we are building uh, resource or, or infrastructure as code. So that's where they are checking in their Terraform templates to build their codes. The biggest question is, how do we handle the tool? Where does it sit? Where does it reside? So the way we implement the tool is in the CI CD infrastructure pipeline. We introduce a new stage called validation stage. This stage is the mandatory stage. So if you're building an application and an infrastructure as code, you cannot overstep 
the validation stage. The validation stage has to be passed for your infrastructure to be built. So looking at the diagrams again now, so if a developer who's developing App 100 has written a code to deploy a resource in AWS. That in turn triggers the pipeline, which is the build stages, and a validation stage gets triggered. The logic in validation stage intercepts every single resource that you build on AWS, right? If you're building an IAM resource or a security group, et cetera, et cetera. So in this case, we're gonna stick to the IAM roles and policies. So here in validation stage, it is going to intercept the build of either a role or a policy. Once it intercepts the building of the resource, it concludes based upon the finding whether that policy or role or resource that it's trying to create, is it a compliant resource or a non-compliant resource? If it's a compliant resource, it is allowed to move forward and go ahead and do the build process. However, if it's not compliant, we break the build. That means nothing gets created and the build stops right there. So the next logical question is, what is happening in the validation stage? So the secret sauce here is, we're relieving it, is the developers now have app 100, which calls the validation stage, as we know. The validation stage in turn intercepts the resource, and it sends, in this case, we're concentrating on the IAM policy, right? So, so it sends the IAM policy to AWS Access Analyzer for policy validation. The AWS Access Analyzer, as you all know, has hundreds of checks in built into it, and they are frequently being updated. So AWS Access Analyzer reviews the policies that you're trying to create and sends the result back to the validation stage. The validation stage then takes this result, it combines it with the Guardian's minimum baseline security standard, and it concludes on the compliancy of the policy that is being created. So a combination of access analyzer plus the internal guardian minimum baseline security standard would result into whether the policy is compliant or non-compliant. So a non-compliant policy, again, the build breaks and it's not allowed to move forward. So when we talk about empowering automating developers to build code, it is very crucial and essential to have a good feedback. So here we're gonna talk into an example where our developers who are trying to build App 100 is going to validation stage. The validation stage looks at the policy, combines it with the, the local guardians MBS controls, and it figures that the policy is non-compliant. That means it is either an over permissive policy or it is a policy that is not allowed to be built. What happens in that case, the build obviously breaks, so, so it's not going to allow the developers to develop the infrastructure. The build breaks, but after the build breaks, it sends an email out to the developer with a lot of detailed information. And this is the feedback loop. So if the policy is, is it compliant, it gets built. If the policy is non-compliant, you break the build and you send an email back to the user on the non-compliancy. So what is the use of non-compliancy? So for example, let's, let's assume our developer is building his application and he's also building a role that needs a policy. And one of the policies that he's trying to write is he looked at his buddy and he said, hey look, I need to pass a role. What policy should I use? He Googled it, he found this piece of code, he pasted it in saying, all right, I'm gonna go build it. So this is the policy that he's trying to build. Now I'm gonna take uh, a few seconds here to explain the policy for people who are, are not too versatile in roles and policies. So this policy is called IM305 demo policy. And if you look at the statement, what it does, its action is IM pass role, the effect is allow, and the resource is star. What it basically means in a nutshell is whoever has this policy is allowed to pass a role to a resource or an entity. This policy is a very permissive policy. Why? Let's take a simple scenario where you have developers and DevOps engineers in your environment trying to create infrastructure, for example, right? 
and they write this code and have the policy assigned to them. Now remember, the developer and the DevOps engineer can build EC2 instances, right? Because that's what they're supposed to do, is build it, build servers. If they have this policy, they can build a server and then assign server an administrative role, right? Because there's nothing stopping them. So if there's no underlying other policy that stops them assigning this role, the developer or the DevOps engineer can assign the server an administrative role. All he has to do is log into the server and use server's credentials to make API calls. So suddenly you have a developer with limited role. He spins up an EC2 instance and he becomes an administrator. So that's how this role is really very permissive. So going back to our app 100, this developer who's, who's new to Terraform and a AWS tries to build this policy. It gets intercepted by the validation stage. The validation stage reviews this policy that it's trying to build. And it says, uh-oh, no go. So if there is no feedback loop, and if we just break the build, the developer will never know what went wrong. I mean, he'll be clueless. So what we do is in the email, the, the email feedback that we send back to the developers, what we do is we have a detailed instruction on why the build failed, which includes anything that was non-compliant from a validation stage. So let's take a look at a snippet, not the entire email, but we have a little snippet of what the, what the developers get back, right? Oops, <laughs> that keeps flipping back and forth. So this is a piece of code that they will get in an email. Now looking at it, you, you'll see uh, a lot of different lines and context. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna highlight a few of them that are essential to you reading it. The first one is finding severity, which is highlighted in green. Finding severity is a logical conclusion that a validation stage reaches after evaluating your policy and the Guardian's security uh, baseline. It finds that this policy is high in severity. The reason why this is important is because as you write your own CI CD pipelines, you can interpret this and let the build pass in lower environments. So for example, if the developer's building this policy in your dev environment, you might not want to break the build, you might just want to warn him. So that, that logic can be built in with the severity finding. Whereas if it's production, you obviously don't want him to build this. The next is the policy details itself. So remember our app 100, the developer is trying to build a role. Now that role can have a lot of different policies in it and all these policies are getting evaluated, right? So if, it get, if, it, if you get a failure, which policy is it complaining about? So basically this gives you an ARN number and the name of the policy that it has found issues on. The next is the finding type, which is a security warning. And the most important one that I find it really useful for developers is learn more links. Now usually the learn more links is an AWS documentation website that will tell you why this policy that you're trying to build is dangerous and also would recommend you to, uh, uh, to tighten down the permissive policy. So I'll give you an example where our app 100, if he's trying to build this app, he will get an email and when he, click on, he clicks on the link, which is at the bottom of your screen here, it will open up a well-documented AWS page and, and AWS has tons of documentation on policy best practices. So going back to our IAM role or IAM pass role, it will tell you why IAM pass role with wildcards is a very permissive policy. And then it will also tell you different ways you can remediate these policies or different guardrails that you can keep to tighten this policy down. Now with experts, with, with security experts, this is a no-brainer, right? You can say I am pass role, you can see. But as a developer, I have no knowledge about what I am pass role is. This plays a very critical role in the feedback process because now I can read through why what I did was wrong and what can I do to fix it just by looking at the documentation instead of reaching out to security team, asking him, hey, something's broken, take a look at it. So he can then go back to his code and fix the code. So there will be times when developers will come to you and they will say, uh, no matter what, I need this built. 
um, whatever security filings we need to file, we can file, but the application needs to access this resource in this particular fashion. The tool is designed to take exceptions because we all know there's gonna be rules and there's gonna be exceptions, always. So here, the exception process is a centralized process which is monitored by the security team and it's approved by the security team. Since it's a centralized process, it goes through peer review process and then it goes through the security, pro security review and then there's a risk filing and then there's the exception that are written down into, into a file. So let's take a look, going back to our application 100 and our developer who somehow found a snippet of code on Google is trying to build a policy for I am passable. He gets an email, he understands, but then he's still adamant because the application needs the I am passable for whatever reason. I can't think of any, but if you guys can think, just let me know. So here is a developer who said, well, I'm gonna file an exception because it's a documented process, the email has the link to the documentation. So he files an exception which goes through peer review and then it goes to the security team for review or process before they get it merged. Important thing here to notify is there's two kinds of exception process that the tool can handle right now. There's a global exception, which basically covers the entire umbrella. So you can say no matter what application, this account is allowed to build I am passable with a star in it. And then it will not make, it will not interfere you with you building any application with that particular policy. And there is an application based exception. Now remember we talked about each individual application having a code. So we basically tie down the application and the exception process using the code. So assuming I am pass role, the developer have now raised a PR with the security team and the security team has for some reason approved it it gets merged into the policy exception files repo. So now we have an exception files. So holistically, let's take a look at the diagram again, and this is the logical view of how the tool works. So at the bottom, you have the tooling team. Their tool gets called during the validation stage. In the midsection, you have developers trying to build the infrastructure, and at the top, there's an insecurity team that is managing the exception process. So going back, the developer now has the exception in place. Now he triggers the pipeline again. It goes to the build stage, it goes to the validation stage. Validation stage says some resource is found. Which resource? I am policy, call I am access analyzer. I am access analyzer says this is my findings. The validation stage says, oh, this is a very permissive policy. I'm gonna mark it as non-compliant. However, because the tool is now equipped to handle exceptions, Instead of breaking the build, what it's going to do is it's going to see if there's an exception file at a global level, right? Is, is an exception available at global? If it is, don't care, you can pass. If it doesn't find any global exceptions, it then looks for the application-based exception. So if this particular app, which is app 100, has an exception file, so in our case, it does find the exception. Now, when it, because it finds the exception, now instead of marking the policy as non-compliant, it is going to mark the policy as compliant policy with exception. And then it will be allowed to move on to later stages where the actual infrastructure is being built. Right? So what do we gain out of all of these things we talked about? Th there's a there's couple of high bullet points that, that we cover uh, from a developer experience perspective, right? So, so this pipeline not only helps you be accountable, so every developer is accountable for the resource that they try to create. It has a faster loopback cycle because you get an email instantly once you, once you have ran, you have a link, you click on it, you read through it, you make your change, you start again. So it's a, it's a great feedback loop. Plus it empowers the developers because now the developers can write their code and change them very quickly based upon the response. And because they are able to do so, ultimately you have a very happy developer experience, right? So we talked a lot about the tool in the logical sense. We, we looked at the diagram and the workflow and how it's engineered. Uh, I bet you guys will be really thrilled to see this in action. So I'll give it over to Bohan who's going to give us a live demo of the tool.
solution. Now let's take a look how it works in action. Let's first take a look the environment that was set up for this demo. We're using AWS Core Commit as our source code repository where the Terraform template is stored. We've created a CICD pipeline using AWS Core Pipeline and the AWS Core Build that I will explain shortly. So the pipeline starts when I commit to AWS Core Commit. AWS Core Pipeline will detect a change in my source code repository and it will cause an AWS Core Build project which invokes the IAM policy compliance check, code, compliance check tool. So if the IAM policy compliance check tool completes successfully, it will cause a separate AWS Core Build project to deploy Terraform template. Now, let's come back to this diagram and take a look what we're doing here in this demo. For step one, I already completed as part of my environment setup, where I committed the source code of IAM policy compliance check um, tool code to my AWS code commit source code repository. Now in the demo, I am a developer. I'm going to commit a Terraform template to AWS code, com code commit. The pipeline detects a change and then begins step three, the validation stage. Now in the validation stage, again, it invokes the IAM policy compliance check tool. Basically what it does, it extracts IAM policies from my Terraform template and it runs through policy validation with IAM access analyzer, showing as step 3.1 at the top of the screen there. Now in this demo, I'm going to skip the steps for checking exceptions. And then I will show you step four, where I get a failed pipeline because my Terraform template contains a problematic IAM policy. Now as a developer, I'm going to look into the pipeline execution details and use the information provided to me and attempt to fix my IAM policy. Then I go back to step two, I commit changes, repeat step three, and finally I will reach to step five where the validation stage completes successfully and then my Terraform template is deployed. One final thing before we get to the demo, let's take a look at the IAM policy we're using in this demo. So the IAM policy on the screen here allows me to perform some Lambda operations. Let's take a look at the statement at the bottom with IAM Pastoral to see how I scope down permissions here. As Hotu explained, I want to scope down, I want to restrict my Pastoral's permission. Using a namespace really helps here. In this case, I'm only allowed to pass rows in the namespace of a topping. And I'm only allowed to pass rows to Lambda functions is restricted by the condition block. So I have a condition here saying pass to service equals to lambda. Now in the demo, I'm going to start with a different version of this IAM policy with pretty broad permissions. And then I will show you how I use the CSCD pipeline solution we described in this presentation to help me scope down permissions. Now we are at uh, AWS console. Let's first go to AWS code commit. So 
So we can see two source code repository here. The first one is to store my Terraform templates, and the second one is to store the source code of IAM policy compliance check tool. Let's go take a look at my Terraform template. So for uh, folks who are not familiar with Terraform in the room, this is a very common structure of a testing or small Terraform project. And the main code is stored in main.tf file. Let's go take a look what's in there. On line three, I am trying to create an I, I am policy document. You may notice that um, in the first statement, the past execution role statement, I have really broad pass row permissions that allow me to pass, pass any role. So moving on, the second statement is allowing me to browse Lambda functions. And the third statement here is allowing me to view and create some Lambda functions. On the line here, the Lambda function I'm allowed to view and create is restricted to the current account, also in the namespace of a pizza. Finally, on line 41, I'm trying to create an IAM policy resource using the policy document I just created. Now, question time. When I commit this Terraform template to AWS code commit, my source code repository, raise your hand if you think my pipeline is going to fail. And raise your hand if you think my pipeline is gonna pass. All right, so there's no right or wrong answer to my question. The decisions of flagging a pipeline as fail or pass is a piece of code of the tool. You have the flexibility to define what factors can impact the decision and how your decision can be made. So the factors can be the finding severity, the finding type, the environment you're running in, or your AWS account ID. So now, the current configuration of my tool that I'm using in this demo is based on finding type returned by IAM Access Analyzer. Furthermore, I defined that any security warning type of finding is going to make the tool execution unsuccessful. Now with that in mind, let's go take a look at uh, my pipeline execution. Now we're at uh, AWS Code Pipeline Console. I've created this CICD pipeline for this demo. We can see that the pipeline failed at the second stage, the validation stage. Now let's take a look what's going on there. So the pipeline execution logs contain a lot of information. It contains information such as uh, installing, ins installing dependencies, downloading the source code, and we are going to jump into the output of IAM policy compliance check tool. To make it easier to walk you through the logs, I'm going to look for a keyword.
before I get into the output of the tool, let me quickly walk you through how the tool is involved. So on line 457 is where we invoke the tool. So we are seeing here is I am invoking a Python project. And then there are some parameters are required to pass into the tool. So I want to take a closer look of one of the parameter, the template path. So template path is a parameter that is looking for the path to a file that is a human readable file generated from Terraform plan file. So before we invoke this tool, a list of commands will run. Starting from first, we run Terraform plan. We save the output file to a file. And then we generate a human readable file from this plan file. Specifically, we run a command Terraform show. And then we're going to save that human readable file. We're going to save the path to that file into a variable. In this case, uh, the plan path is that variable. And we're going to use that to invoke the tool. The output of the tool falls into two categories, blocking findings and the non-blocking findings. So blocking findings are the findings is going to fail my pipeline versus non-blocking findings. It still gives me details about the findings. However, it's going to pass the pipeline. So if you remember, as I explained just now, I am defining any security warning type of finding is going to fail my pipeline. So we are seeing here on line 461, I have a security warning type of finding. There are a lot more information here. For example, on line 463, it has a message basically telling me why this IAM policy gets this finding. And on line 464 here, it gives me the name of the IAM policy that generates the finding. In this case, it's called demo policy. So if I'm a developer, I'm, I'm, run, I'm writing a Terraform template, contains multiple IAM policies. This will help me to quickly pinpoint which IAM policy is causing the problem. And finally, on line 470, this is the learn more link that Hotu just explained. So this is a link point you to a AWS public documentation to tell you what is this finding about and then what are some action items you can do to remediate this finding. Now, I have all this information and I'm going to attempt to fix my IAM policy. I'm using Cloud9 as my development environment and my IDE. So I'm going to fix this pass row statement and then scope down the permissions. I've prepared a snippet. So I'm going to copy and paste it. So how am I scoping down permissions here? Again, first I'm restricting the rows that I'm allowed to pass to the current account in the namespace of a topping. And then I added a condition block that allows me to only pass rows to Lambda functions. So 
I'm going to save and commit the changes. As soon as I push the code to my source code repository, the pipeline is gonna detect the change and trigger an execution. It's gonna take a couple minutes to execute. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you an execution history. Then I'm going to walk you through the details so that we can save a couple minutes there. So I am going back to my pipeline. I'm going to click on history. So I have a pipeline that um, was successful in the past. Let's go take a look. I'm going to click on virtualization. And then let's go to validate stage to take a look. Again, I'm going to search for keywords, blocking findings, because remember those are the findings gonna block my, gonna fail my pipeline execution. So, what you're seeing here, I got zero blocking findings. That's why my pipeline was executed successfully. I still got a non-blocking finding. So what it's telling me is that this is a suggestion that one of the statement in my IAM policy is missing a SID. So as a developer, I have an option using this information to further improve my IAM policy. However, I got a successfully execute, executed pipeline. So to conclude, I started with a Terraform template containing a very permissive IAM policy. Then I used this CICD pipeline solution to provide me with feedback and information and help me to scope down the permissions in my IAM policy. So with that, I'd like to hand it back to Michael to talk about what we accomplished. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Bohan, for making that real for the audience. We've come a really long way. We came from a world where there's one of two not great possibilities. We have fully empowering developers, but most likely giving way more access than what we'd really like. Or the other one, we injecting security deeply into the process, manually blocking developers, and stifling innovation. Neither of those scenarios are great. We have now shown you a solution where we go ahead and automate that interaction blurring the lines between security and tech to be, to be able to, so we can innovate quickly while still having the proper security. So you've, we've gone ahead and shown you a lot of technical aspects today, but this also has clear visibility and knowledge from, like, and respect from our uh, senior leaders. This is a quote from our deputy CISO, Greg Kay. Sorry, I cannot say your last name, Greg. Um, he, he, this is a quote from him that basically says, look, we can go ahead and fa fastly deploy code while also making sure that our controls aren't over permissive. This goes ahead and supports the overarching um, uh, trend in the industry to go ahead and shift left with security and blur the lines between the organizations. So uh, before we end, just wanted to say, please fill out your surveys. Um, we are gonna take Q&A on the side. Uh, thank you, Bohan, thank you, Atul, for your time, and thank you all for your time. Have a lovely day. <laughs>